Today, the job of building this nation geographically is completed. There are no new frontiers within our borders. So, to what new horizons can we look now? Where are tomorrow's opportunities? What's ahead for you, for your children? The frontiers of the future are not on any map. They are in the test tubes and laboratories of the great industries. The Jacobardi case was one of the great judicial moments in world history. And the public was totally unaware it was actually happening as the process was being engaged. General Electric and Professor Jacobardi went to the patent office with a little microbe that eats up oil spills. They said they had modified this microbe in the laboratory and therefore it was an invention. The patent office, the U.S. government, took a look at this, quote, invention, and they said, no way. The patent statutes don't cover living things. This is not an invention. Turn down. Then General Electric and Dr. Jacobardi appealed to the U.S. Customs Court of Appeal. And to everyone's surprise, by a three to two decision, they overrode the patent office. We bring good things to life. And they said, this microbe looks more like a detergent or a reagent than a horse or a honeybee. I laughed because they didn't understand basic biology. It looked like a chemical to them. Had it had an antenna or eyes or wings or legs, it would never have crossed their table and been patented. Then the patent office appealed. And what the public should realize now is the patent office was very clear that you can't patent life. My organization provided the main amicus curiae brief. If you allow the patent on this microbe, we argued, it means that without any congressional guidance or public discussion, corporations will own the blueprints of life. When they made the decision, we lost by five to four, and Chief Justice Warren Burger said, sure, some of these are big issues, but we think this is a small decision. Seven years later, the U.S. Patent Office issued a one-sentence decree. You can patent anything in the world that's alive except a full-birth human being. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled today that living organisms produced in the laboratory may be patented. This decision to extend the, the U.S. Supreme Court had to decide was whether one man or one company should be able to control new forms of life. We allow any yes. company or college to exclusively own a species. What does that say about our reverence for life? Researchers at Harvard manipulated the genes of mice, making their offspring more susceptible to cancer. They patented the Harvard mouse in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, then tried to do the same. legal battle that finally came to an end today. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled the genetically engineered mouse can't can Canadian rights to it. Canadians don't think that life forms are inventions of industry like light bulbs and widgets. Scientists and drug companies search the planet for genes. Companies scouring the planet looking for valuable DNA, genes they can patent and sell. DNA. It feels a lot like the Wild West. We've got uh, bandits going around the world, collecting wherever they can, sometimes under false pretenses. Because it's been so isolated, Newfoundland has a unique gene pool. And there's been so much interest from gene print. prospectors, My the government is funding a study. really has been taken away from me. Instead of being the impartial pursuit of the truth, has become the pursuit of profit. We've all been hearing about the announcement that we have mapped the human genome. But what the public doesn't know is now there's a great race by genomic companies and biotech companies and life science companies to find the treasure in the map. The treasure are the individual genes that make up the blueprint of the human race. Every time they capture a gene and isolate it, these biotech companies claim it as intellectual property. The breast cancer gene, the cystic fibrosis gene, it goes on and on and on if this goes unchallenged in the world community. Within less than 10 years, a handful of global companies will own directly or through license the actual genes that make up the evolution of our species. And they're now beginning to patent the genomes of every other creature on this planet. In the age of biology, the politics is going to sort out between those who believe life first has intrinsic value and therefore we should choose technologies and commercial venues that honor the intrinsic value. And then we're gonna have people who believe, look, life is simple utility. It's commercial fare, and they will line up with the idea to let the marketplace be the ultimate arbiter of all of the age of biology.
world economy where information is filtered by global media corporations, keenly attuned to their powerful advertisers? Who will defend the public's right to know? And what price must be paid to preserve our ability to make informed choices? What Fox Television told us was that we were just the people to be the investigators. Do any stories you want, ask tough questions, and get answers. So we thought, this is great. This is a dream job. Fantastic. The very first thing they had us do was not to research stories, but to shoot this promo, which was The, the investigators. investigators. Uncovering the truth. Getting results. Protecting you. And they had a film crew and a smoke machine, and we were silhouetted. Investigative reporter Steve. One of the first stories that Jane came up with was the uh, revelation that most of the milk in the state of Florida and throughout much of the country uh, was adulterated with the effects of bovine growth hormone. With Monsanto, I didn't realize how effectively a corporation could work to get something on the marketplace. The levels of coordination they had to have. They had to get university professors into the fold. They had to get experts into the fold. They had to get reporters into the fold. They had to get the public into the fold. And of course, the FDA, let's not leave them out. They had to get the federal regulators convinced that this was a fine and safe product um, to get it onto the marketplace. And they did that. They did that very, very well. Ozilac is the single most tested new product in history and is now available to you specifically so you can increase your profit potential. The federal government basically rubber stamped it before they put it on the marketplace. The longest test they did for human toxicity was 90 days on 30 rats and then either Monsanto misreported the results to the FDA or the FDA didn't bother to look in depth at Monsanto's own studies. The scientists within Health Canada looked very carefully at bovine growth hormone and came to very different conclusions than the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. did. Monsanto's engineered growth hormone did not comply with safety requirements. It could be absorbed by the body and therefore did have implications for human health. Mysteriously, that conclusion was deleted from the final published version of their report. I personally was very concerned that there's a very serious problem of secrecy, conspiracy, and uh, things of that nature. We have been pressured and coerced to pass drugs of questionable safety, including the RBST. We wrote the story. We had it ready a week beforehand. They bought ads. Farmers in the milk industry say it's safe, but studies suggest a link to cancer. Don't miss this special report from the investigators. That Friday night before the Monday this series was to begin, the fax machine spit out a letter from this very high-priced lawyer in New York that Monsanto had hired. It contained a lot of things that were just off the wall false, just demonstrably false. But if you didn't know the story and you didn't know how we had gone about producing it, uh, it would have scared you as a broadcaster, as a manager. And they decided that they would pull the story and they would just check it one more time. But the bottom line was that there was no factual errors in that story. Uh, both sides had been heard from. Both sides had had an opportunity to speak. One week later, Monsanto sent the second letter. And this was even more strongly worded. And it said there will be dire consequences for Fox News if the story airs in Florida. And this time they freaked. They were afraid of being sued, and they were also afraid of losing advertising dollars at all of the stations owned by Rupert Murdoch. And he owned more television stations than any other group in America. And that's 22 television stations. That's a lot of advertising dollars for Roundup, Aspartame, NutraSweet, and uh, other products. So we got into a battle. And uh, the first deal was uh, the new general manager. And his name's Dave. And Dave is a salesman, and, you know, he'd pump your hand. How you doing? How you doing? Called us upstairs to his office, and he said, um, what would you say if I killed this piece? What if it never ran? And we said, well, you know, we wouldn't be very happy about that. And he said, well, I could kill it, you know. And we said, yes, of course, you're the manager. You could kill it. It, it would never air. And uh, he's hemming, and he's hawing, and he's back, and he's forth. And we couldn't figure out, what is this all about? And finally, he blurted out, look, would you tell anybody? You know, I said, I'm not going to lie for you. About a week later, calls us back to the office and says, okay, we'd like you to make these changes. In fact, you will make these changes. We said, well, look, let us show you the research that we have that shows that this information you want us to broadcast isn't true. To which he replies, I don't care about that. I said, pardon me? 
And he said, uh, well, that's what I have lawyers for. Just write it the way the lawyers want it written. I said, you know, this is news. This is important. This is stuff people need to know. And I'll never forget, he didn't pause a beat, and he said, we just paid $3 billion for these television stations. We'll tell you what the news is. The news is what we say it is. I said, I'm not doing that. And he said, well, he said, if you refuse to present this story the way we think it should be presented, you'll be fired for insubordination. I said, I will go to the Federal Communications Commission and I will report that I was fired from my job by you, the licensee of these public airwaves, because I refused to lie to people on the air. And uh, it's thank you very much. Uh, you'll hear from us right away. Well, 24 hours came and went, and we didn't hear a thing. And about a week later, he calls us back, and now we've changed strategies. How about if we pay you some money and you just go away? And I said, how much money? Because, you know, when somebody offers to bribe you like that, I always want to know if it might be worth it. He was going to offer us the rest of our year's salary if we agreed not to talk about what Monsanto had done, to not talk about the Fox corporate response in suppressing the story, and to not talk about the story, not talk about BGH again, anywhere, not take the story to another news organization. Just zip up. I said, you mean if I want to go to my daughter's PTA meetings and explain what's in the school milk at the school lunch program? I, I can't, no. You can never speak about this anywhere. And Steve says, okay, write it up. And I'm like, write it up? What are you talking about? Write it up. And uh, I didn't say anything. And uh, Dave, he wrote it up. And he FedExed it to us a couple days later. And he said, are you going to sign? And we said, nah, Dave, we're not going to sign that. And he said, well, send it back, okay? I said, no, Dave, we're not going to send that back. It was, okay. We can't buy you out. We can't shut you up. Let's get the story on the air in a way that we can all agree it will go on the air. And we started rewriting and editing with their lawyers. Well, during this eight-month re-review process, I say, jokingly, uh, they did things like, for example, they wanted to take out the word cancer. You don't have to identify what the potential problem is. But just say human health implications. Any criticism of Monsanto or its product, they either removed it or minimized it. And it was very, very clear, I would say, almost every edit they made to the piece, that was the aim. And we changed this and this and this, and then that wasn't good enough. Okay, now change this and this and this. Now change this and this. Version after version after version, 83 times. 83 times is unheard of. It doesn't happen. You shouldn't have to rewrite something 83 times. Obviously, they didn't want to put the thing on the air. And they were trying to drive us crazy and get us to quit or wait until the first window in our contract so that they could fire us. They, in effect, announced that they were going to fire us uh, for no cause. Well, this was a little much. And Steve wrote a letter to the lawyer in Atlanta, whose name is Carolyn Forrest, the Fox corporate lawyer. And I said, you know, this isn't about being fired for no cause. You're firing us because we refused to put on the air something that we knew and demonstrated to be false and misleading. That's what this is about. And because we put up a fight, because we stood up to this big corporation and we stood up to your editors and we stood up to your lawyers and we said to you, look, there ought to be a principle higher than just making money. And she wrote a letter back and said, you're right, that's exactly what it was. You stood up to us on this story, and that's why we're letting you go. Big mistake. Big mistake. That says retaliation. You can't retaliate against employees if they're standing up for something that they believe is illegal, that they don't want to participate in. So that gave us the whistleblower status that we needed in the state of Florida to file a whistleblower claim against our employer. And as far as our Two or three years later, we got to trial. Uh, five weeks of testimony led to a jury verdict of $425,000, uh, in which the jury determined that the story they pressured us to broadcast, the story we resisted telling, was in fact false, distorted, or slanted. Fox News appealed the verdict. Five major news media corporations filed briefs with the court in support of Fox's appeal. The 
You may recall that Jane Acri, a former reporter here, sued Fox 13 in a whistleblower lawsuit, claiming she was fired for refusing to distort her report. The appeals court today threw that case out, saying Ms. Acri had no whistleblower claim against the station based on news distortion. Fox 13 Vice President and General Manager Bob Linger says the station has been completely vindicated by the ruling. What Fox neglected to report is this. Jane sued Fox under Florida's whistleblower statute, which protects those who try to prevent others from breaking the law. But her appeal court judges found that falsifying news isn't actually against the law. So they denied Jane her whistleblower status, overturned the case, and withdrew her $425,000 award. Canada and Europe have upheld the ban on RBGH, yet it remains hidden in much of the milk supply of the United States. The prospect that two-thirds of the world's population will have no access to fresh drinking water by 2025 has provoked the initial confrontations in a worldwide battle for control over the planet's most basic resource. When Bolivia sought to refinance the public water service of its third largest city, the World Bank required that it be privatized, which is how the Bechtel Corporation of San Francisco gained control over all of Cochabamba's water, even that which fell from the sky. Esta ley y este contrato prohibían a la gente acumular el agua de la lluvia. Por lo tanto, el agua de la lluvia también se privatizaba. La factura de agua le daba un valor legal a la empresa para que pueda apropiarse de su, de su propiedad, de su vivienda, rematando la misma. La gente debía eh, optar por una decisión de comer menos, pagar del agua, pagar por los servicios básicos, dejar de mandar a los niños a la escuela, eh, no asistir a los hospitales y curarse en la propia casa, o en todo caso, eh, gente jubilada, por ejemplo, que tiene una renta muy, muy baja, debería eh, buscar trabajo en las calles. La consigna de el agua es nuestra, carajo. La gente sale a las calles, sale a los caminos y eh, protesta. ¿no? The price this beleaguered country paid for World Bank loans was the privatization of the state oil industry and its airline, railroad, electric, and phone companies. But the government failed to convince Bolivians that water is a commodity like any other. Entonces, eh, ahí sí eh, vimos eh, que el gobierno defendía los intereses de la transnacional Bechtel porque la gente quería agua, no gases. La gente quería justicia y no balas. Estas son las imágenes que reflejan definitivamente la situación que vivió Cochabamba durante la jornada de este viernes. Bolivia was determined to defend the corporation's right to charge families living on two dollars a day as much as one quarter of their income for water. The greater the popular resistance to the water privatization scheme, the more violent became the standoff. Y por eso vieron centenares de heridos jóvenes que a sus 16, 17 años perdieron brazos, perdieron piernas, quedaron paralíticos, quedaron lesionados de la cabeza de por vida y murió mmm, Víctor Hugo Daza. Transnational corporations have a long and dark history of condoning tyrannical governments. Is it narcissism that compels them to seek their reflection in the regimented structures of fascist regimes?
There was an interesting connection between the rise of fascism in Europe and the consciousness of politically radical people about corporate power uh, because there was a recognition that fascism rose in Europe with the help of enormous corporations. Mussolini was greatly admired all across the spectrum. Business loved him. Investment shot up. And suddenly when Hitler came in in Germany, the same thing happened there. Investment shot up in Germany. He had the workforce under control. He was getting rid of dangerous left-wing elements. Investment opportunities were improving. There was no problems. These are wonderful countries. I think one of the greatest untold stories of the 20th century is the collusion between corporations, especially in America, and Nazi Germany. First, in terms of how the corporations from America helped to essentially rebuild Germany and support the early Nazi regime. And then, when the war broke out, figured out a way to keep everything going. So General Motors was able to keep Opel going, Ford was able to keep their thing going, and companies like Coca-Cola, because they couldn't keep the Coca-Cola going, so what they did was they invented Fanta Orange for the Germans. And that's how Coke was able to keep their profits coming in to Coca-Cola. So when you drink Fanta Orange, that's the Nazi drink. That was created so that Coke could continue making money while millions of people died. When Hitler came to power in 1933, his goal was to dismantle and destroy the Jewish community. This was an enterprise so fast that it required the resources of a computer. But in 1933, there was no computer. What there was was the IBM punch card system, which controlled and stored information based upon the holes that were punched in various rows and columns. Naturally, there was no off-the-shelf software as there is today. Each application was custom designed and an engineer had to personally configure it. Millions of people of all religions and nationalities and characteristics went through the concentration camp system. That's an extraordinary traffic management program that required an IBM system in every railroad direction and an IBM system in every concentration camp. Now, this is a typical prisoner card. There are little boxes where all the information is to be punched in. We compare this information to the code sheet for concentration camps. And here you see Auschwitz is one, Buchenwald two, Dachau is three. Now, what kinds of prisoners were they? They could be a Jehovah's Witness for two, a homosexual for three, communist for six, or a Jew would be eight. Now, what was their status? One was released, two was transferred, four was executed, five was suicide, and six. Code six, Sonderbehandlung, special treatment, meant the gas chamber or sometimes a bullet. They would punch that number in, the material was tabulated, the machines were set, and of course, the punch cards, by the millions, had to be printed, and they were printed exclusively by IBM, and the profits were recovered just after the war. I really do believe that that particular accusation has been fairly discredited as a serious accusation. That is, the fact that they have used equipment, you know, that is a fact, but how they got it, how much cooperation they got, and any kind of collusion trying to connect dots that are not connected, I think that's the part that is discredited. Generally, you sell computers, and they're used in a variety of ways, and you always hope they're used in the more positive ways possible. If you ever found out they are used in ways that are not positive, then you would hope that you stop supporting that. But do you always know? Can you always tell? Can you always find out? 
IBM would of course say that it had no control over its German subsidiary. But here on October 9th of 1941, a letter is being written directly to Thomas J. Watson with all sorts of detail about the activities of the uh, German subsidiary. None of these machines were uh, sold. They were all leased by IBM and they had to be serviced on site once a month, even if that was at a concentration camp such as Dachau Buchenwald. This is a typical uh, contract with IBM and the Third Reich which was instituted in, nine, in 1942. It's not with the Dutch subsidiary, it's not with the German subsidiary, it is with the IBM Corporation in New York. You know, as it happens, I know that story. I discussed it more than once with old Mr. Watson, and I was around at the time. I'm not saying that Watson didn't know that the German government used punch cards. He probably did know. After we had very few customers, Watson didn't want to do it. Watson, not because he thought it was immoral or not, but because Watson, with a very keen sense of public relations, thought it was risky. It should not surprise us that corporate allegiance to profits will trump their allegiance to any flag. A recent U.S. Treasury Department report revealed that in one week alone, 57 U.S. corporations were fined for trading with official enemies of the United States including terrorists, tyrants, and despotic regimes. You can roughly locate any community somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. For big business, despotism was often a useful tool for securing foreign markets and pursuing profits. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals, Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies, Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank, Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers Brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. fruit companies, and China for Standard Oil. General Butler's services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. But the country was not entirely behind the populist president. Large parts of the corporate elite despised what Roosevelt's New Deal stood for. And so, in 1934, a group of conspirators sought to involve General Butler in a treasonous plan. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government. But the corporate cabal had picked the wrong man. Butler was fed up with being what he called a gangster for capitalism. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A congressional committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. As today's chairman of Goodyear Tire knows, for corporations to dominate government, a coup is no longer necessary. Corporations have gone global. And by going global, the uh, governments have lost some control over corporations, regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted. Governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become 
powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and reigning oligarchs of our system. So capitalism and its principal protagonists and players, corporate CEOs, have been accorded unusual power and access. This is not to deny the significance of government and politicians, but these are the new high priests. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to attend this meeting that was being put together by the National Security Agency called the Critical Thinking Consortium. I remember standing there in this room and looking over on one side of the room, and we had CIA, NSA, DIA, FBI, Customs, Secret Service. Uh, and then on the other side of the room, we had... Coca-Cola, Mobile Oil, GTE, and Kodak. And I remember thinking, I am like in the epicenter of the intelligence industry right now. I mean, the line is not just blurring, it's just not there anymore. And to me, it, it spoke volumes as to how industry and government were consulting with each other and working with each other. As 34 nations of the Western Hemisphere gathered to draft a far-reaching trade agreement, one that would lay the groundwork to privatize every resource and service imaginable, thousands of people from hundreds of grassroots organizations joined to oppose it. Canada's top business lobbyists and its chief trade representative discount the dissent in the streets. For them, the America's 800 million citizens speak with one voice. Nice to see you. Well done on your strong advocacy of uh, trust, truth, justice, wisdom, and all those things. I was looking yesterday at the statements at the inauguration, the opening ceremony. What, what an extraordinary progress Absolutely. over the last 15 years Absolutely. when you heard such a common, a common language. A common language. Yes, and from the most developed to the least, it was, uh, it was extraordinary that now that we see the benefits of trade, more and more people want to buy it, because we do realize that it helps everyone, from the poorer to the better off. So a lot of these countries are not saying we want to get off, they want to get on. Exactly. So no one wants that's out. What it is, Everyone Mr. wants yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well done. So, Thank you. Uh, this is so, far, so, so far, so good. Good. So far, good. So good. I'm inside and this is all outside, so that's, uh, that's the way it is. But, uh... So what do you think when you look at all this? Well, it's, uh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's too bad that, that this has, uh, that this has erupted. I see. Does there need to be some measure of accountability? Yes. And I think the business community recognizes that. But that accountability is in the marketplace. It's with their shareholders. It's with the public perception and the public image that they are projecting. That's, if, if, if companies don't do what they should be doing, they're going to be punished in the marketplace. And that's not what any company wants. There's a new market. These guys and gals aren't out there because government's putting a gun to their head 
or because they've suddenly read a book about transcendental meditation and global morality. My inner voice says honor my inner child. Mine says love everyone. My inner voice says I like a Wendy's bacon mushroom milk. They're there because they understand the market requires them to be there, that there's competitive advantage to be there. I am listening to your concerns. I worry about climate. I worry about pollution. I do not have all the answers to this, but we are prepared to work with you, with society, with NGOs, with governments to address it. So you rebuild the trust so that you come back to a new kind of trust. And then the, the, the ultimate goal is then to become a corporation of choice. He believes that almost half our energy could one day come from renewable sources. He's been called a dreamer and a crank. And I've been called a hippie. And more recently, a project manager for Shell. I ask myself oftentimes why so many companies subscribe to corporate social responsibility. I'm not sure it's because they necessarily want to be responsible in an ultimate way, but because they want to be identified and seen to be responsible. But who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? It's better they belong than not belong. It's better that they make some public profession than, than the opposite. Social responsibility isn't a deep shift because it's a voluntary tactic, a tactic, a reaction to a certain market uh, at this point. And as the corporation reads the market differently, it can go back. One day you see Bambi, next day you see Godzilla. How do you define socially responsible? What business is it of the corporation to decide what's so socially responsible? That isn't their expertise. That isn't what uh, their stockholders asked them to do. So I think they're going out of their range and it certainly is not democratic. I don't really care what the chairman of General Motors thinks is an appropriate level of emissions to come out the tailpipe of General Motors automobiles. He may have a lot of scientists, he may be a very good person, but I didn't elect him to anything. He doesn't have any power to speak for me. These are decisions that must be made by government and not by corporations. If you take this to its logical conclusion, one would have an image um, that we are in fact at, at, at this, at this, the end of the world is nigh and, and, and we, are, we are all completely brainwashed and there's no space left. And, 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 and I don't believe we're there yet. And I think it's really important that we don't overstate the case and that we admit that there are f cracks and fissures in all of these corporate structures. And sometimes when a corporation is concentrating on one particular project, they look the other way and all kinds of interesting things happen in the corner. It is the case in every period of history where injustice based on falsehoods, based on taking away the right and freedoms of people to live and survive with dignity, that eventually, when you call a bluff, the tables turn. Ultimately, capital puts its foot down somewhere. And anywhere it puts its foot down, it can be held accountable. Originally, Walmart and Kathy Lee Gifford had said, uh, why should we believe you that children work in this factory? What we didn't tell them was that Wendy Diaz, in the center of the picture, was on a plane to the United States. This is Wendy Diaz. She comes to the United States. She's unstoppable. Congress heard testimony today from children who testified they were exploited by sweatshops overseas. But Kathy Lee Gifford apologized to Wendy Diaz. It was the most amazing thing I'd seen. This powerful celebrity leans over and says, Wendy, Please believe me, I didn't know these conditions existed. And now that I do, I'm going to work with you, I'm going to work with these other people, and it'll never happen again. And that night, we signed an agreement with Kathy Lee Gifford. I thought it would be a relatively easy process, and it isn't. For every question I have, there seem to be five questions that come back at me. 
we have been... As far as Walmart goes and Kathy Lee, pretty much everything returned to sweatshop conditions. But because this was fought out on television for weeks, this incident with Kathy Lee Gifford actually took the sweatshop issue to every single part of the country. And so, frankly, after that, there's hardly a single person in this country who doesn't know about child labor or sweatshops or starvation wages. So what we need to do is to look at the very roots of the legal form that created this beast, and we need to think who can hold them accountable. They're not graven in stone. They can be dismantled. In fact, uh, most states have uh, laws which uh, require that they be dismantled. For too long now, giant corporations have been allowed to undermine democracy here in the United States and all over the world. But today, the National Lawyers Guild and 29 other groups and individuals are fighting back. We are calling upon State Attorney General Dan Lundgren to comply with California law and to revoke the corporate charter of the Union Oil Company of California for its repeated and grievous offenses. This is a statute that is well known. It has been used. It can be used. What this will mean is the dissolution of the Union Oil Company of California, the sale of its assets under careful court orders to others who will carry on in the public interest. This is nothing more than just a smear campaign. This company has um, been part of California's economy for over 100 years, thousands of jobs. Doesn't mean it's never made any mistakes, paid for those mistakes, but this demonizing of a company, I think I'm in a time warp or something that I, I fell asleep and I woke up 50 years ago when we heard that kind of rhetoric. Well, we have a very, very broad set of people angry, well, very angry set of, at this of corporation. People from the left of the spectrum who, who don't produce anything it's except hot right. air from its complicity in unspeakable human rights violations overseas against women, gays, laborers, and indigenous peoples, to its efforts to subvert U.S. foreign policy and deceive the courts, the public, and its own stockholders, Unical is emblematic of corporate abuse and corporate power run amok. Extending a business deal with Burma Army is immoral. Unical cannot do business in Burma without supporting that hopeless regime. It cannot justify. The curse for me has been <laughs> the fact that in making these uh, you know, documentary films, I've seen that they actually can impact change, so I'm just compelled to you know, keep making them. Yep, that's me, doing what I do. All year long, I give big companies a hard time. But at Christmas time, I like to set aside my differences and reach out to big business, like cigarette companies. I went to Littleton, Colorado, where the Columbine shooting took place. And I didn't know this, but when I arrived, I learned what the primary job is of the parents of the kids who go to Columbine High School. The number one job in Littleton, Colorado, they work for Lockheed Martin, building weapons of mass destruction. But they don't see the connect between what they do for a living and what their kids do at school or did at school. And so I'm kind of, you know, up on my, you know, high horse, <laughs> you know, thinking about this. And I thought, you know, I said to my wife, you know, we both are, you know, sons and daughters of auto workers in Flint, Michigan. There isn't a single one of us back in Flint, any of us, including us, who ever stopped to think this thing we do for a living, the building of automobiles, is probably the single biggest reason why the polar ice caps are going to melt and end civilization as we know it. <laughs> There's no connect between... I'm just an assembler on an assembly line building a car, which is good for people in society. It moves them around. But never stop to think about the larger picture and the larger responsibility of what we're doing. Ultimately, we have to, as individuals, 
accept responsibility for our collective action and and the larger harm that it causes you know uh, in, in in our world today the first of two historic town hall meetings will get underway in arcata california 61 percent of arcadians voted in favor of publicly discussing whether democracy is even possible when large corporations wield so much wealth and power under law they also voted to form a committee to ensure democratic control over corporations in arcata Corporations are not accountable to the democratic process. That's what this is about. I don't want to make decisions about everything that goes on in their corporation, but I do have a strong belief that they need to be held accountable to us. Yeah. If we don't like certain products, if we don't like uh, Pepsi Cola, or Bank America, or if you don't like what they do, don't use them. That's the way I see the you know, people's power is. You have a lot more money than me. You have more votes than I do if we use the model of boycott and voting with your dollars. That's, a, that's an undemocratic situation. What are we afraid of? I mean, are all the businesses gonna leave Arcata? I don't think so. And if they did, we'd deal with it or we'd figure it out or we'd do something different. We're creative people. I just don't see why we're afraid. If you think it's tough making a decision where to buy your stuff today, how tough do you think it is when there's only one provider and it's the state? And by the way, you don't get to have this little democracy forum in those communities either. People that say they fear their government, I really hope that they understand that they're allowed to participate in their government. They're not allowed to participate in anything the corporations do. So don't fear the government. Help it be the government that you won't fear. If this many people around the country would do this instead of watching Super Bowl Sunday, our nation would be controlled by the people, not by the corporations. No more chain restaurants in Arcata after a long-awaited decision. Over the past decade, we have been gaining ground. And when I say we, I mean ordinary people, committed to the welfare of all of humanity, all people irrespective of gender and class and race and religion, all species on the planet. We managed to take the biggest government and one of the largest chemical companies to court on the case of Neem and win a case against them. W.R. Grace and the U.S. government's patent on Neem was revoked by a case we brought along with the Greens of European Parliament and the International Organic Agriculture Movement. We won because we worked together. We have overturned nearly 99% of the Basmati patent of rice tech. Again, because we worked as a worldwide coalition. Old women in Texas, scientists in India, activists sitting in Vancouver, a little Basmati action group. We stopped the third world being viewed as the pirate and we showed the corporations were the pirate. Look how little it took for Gandhi to work against the salt laws of the British where the British decided the way they would make their armies and police forces bigger is just tax the salt. And all that Gandhi did was walk to the beach, pick up the salt, and say, nature gives it for free. We need it. We've always made it. We will violate your laws. We will continue to make salt. We've had a similar commitment for the last decade in India that any law that makes it illegal to save seed is a law not worth following. We will violate it because saving seed is a duty to the earth and to future generations. We thought it would really be symbolic. It is more than symbolic. It is becoming a survival option. Farmers who grow their own seeds, save their own seeds, don't buy pesticides, have threefold more incomes than farmers who are locked into the chemical treadmill, depending on Monsanto and Cargill. We have managed to create alternatives that work for people. There are many tools for, for bringing back community. But the importance is not the tools. I mean, there's litigation, there's legislation, there's direct action, there's education, boycotts, social investment. There's many, many ways to, uh, to address issues of corporate power. But in the final analysis, what's really important is the vision. 
you have to have a better story. Do I know you well enough to call you fellow plunderers? There is not an industrial company on earth, not an institution of any kind, not mine, not yours, not anyone's, that is sustainable. I stand convicted by me, myself alone, not by anyone else, as a plunderer of the earth, but not by our civilization's definition. By our civilization's definition, I'm a captain of industry in the eyes of many a kind of modern-day hero. But really, really, the first industrial revolution is flawed. It is not working. It is unsustainable. It is the mistake. And we must move on to another and better industrial revolution and get it right this time. When I think of what could be, I visualize an organization of people committed to a purpose. And the purpose is doing no harm. I see a, a company that has severed the umbilical cord to earth for its raw materials, taking raw materials that have already been extracted and using them over and over again driving that process with renewable energy. It is our plan, it remains our plan to climb Mount Sustainability, that mountain that's higher than Everest, yeah, infinitely higher than Everest, far more difficult to scale. That point at the top symbolizing zero footprint. So we've got to undo a lot of things in order to be smart enough to do this really dangerous and risky and difficult work, you know, uh, the best way that, that we possibly can. And that, that means people coming together and learning a whole, whole, lot, whole lot of stuff that we just don't know, that has been driven out of the culture, driven out of the society, driven out of our minds. That, to me, is the most exciting thing. That is happening. It's happening all over the world now. In cierto momento de la lucha, el momento más culminante, El ejército se eh, acuarteló, la policía también no salió de su, de su cuartel, los congresistas desaparecieron, el gobernador se ocultó, se denunció el gobernador, no había autoridad legal, la única autoridad legítima era el pueblo que estaba en un cabildo, que estaba en la plaza y que tomaba las decisiones en grandes asambleas y al final decidió sobre el agua y creo que la gente, eh, los jóvenes y los viejos de mucho tiempo eh, pudimos eh, saborear, digamos, pudimos eh, saciarnos de esa sed de democracia. ¡Y así lo hemos conseguido, compañeros! Hemos heredado una empresa, como toda empresa pública, con problemas técnicos, con problemas financieros, con problemas legales y con problemas administrativos. Eh, nos estamos enfrentando. Porque si demostramos que es la gente sencilla y trabajadora la que puede dar solución a sus problemas, podemos estar a las puertas de pedir de que todo aquello que se privatizó, todo aquello que se vendió, todo aquello que está en manos de las corporaciones, vuelvan a las manos de la población. Y ahí, me, ahí aprendí una lección muy importante, de que uno no puede desconfiar en la capacidad del pueblo. Un eslogan que siempre yo había repetido en las, en las marchas, de que el pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Y ver eso para mí fue muy grandioso. Sometimes it surprises me how effective you can actually be. After we beat the gap, I'd walk past these gap stores and I look at them and I think, my God, there's like 2,000 inch stores across the country. Look at all that concrete. Look at the glass. Look at all the staff people. Look at all the clothing. Look at that power. You can still 
reach these companies, you can still have an effect. Yo creo que sí hemos ganado, se están ganando pequeñas batallas en el mundo, pero yo creo que la gente está perdiendo la guerra. En eso sí, yo veo el, el futuro, el presente y el futuro para nuestros hijos muy oscuro. Pero confío en la capacidad de reflexión, en la capacidad de indignación y en la capacidad de rebelión de la gente. We can change the government. That's the only way we're going to redesign, rethink, reconstitute what capital and property can do. Fifteen corporations would like to control the conditions of our life. And millions of people are saying, not only do we not need you, we can do it better. We are going to create systems that nourish the earth and nourish human beings. And these are not marginal experiments. They are the mainstay of large numbers of communities across the world. That is where the future lies. You know, I've often thought it's very ironic that I'm able to do all this, and yet what am I on? I'm on networks, I'm distributed by studios that are owned by large corporate entities. Now, why would they put me out there when I am opposed to everything that they stand for? And I spend my time on their dime opposing what they believe in, okay? Well, it's because they don't believe in anything. They put me on there because they know that there's millions of people that want to see my film or watch the TV show, and so they're going to make money. And I've been able to get my stuff out there because I'm driving my truck through this incredible flaw in capitalism, the greed flaw, the thing that says the rich man will sell you the rope to hang himself with if he thinks he can make a buck off it. Well, I'm the rope. I hope. I'm part of the rope. And uh, they also believe that when people watch my stuff or maybe watch this film or whatever, they think that, you know, well, you know what, they'll watch this and they won't do anything, you know, because we've done such a good job of numbing their minds and dumbing them down. Uh, you know, they'll never affect it. The people aren't going to leave the couch and go and do something political. They're convinced of that. I'm convinced of the opposite. I'm convinced that a few people are going to leave this movie theater or get up off the couch and go and do something, anything, to get this world back in our hands.